Okay, um, I think that is now my uh, introduction, um, and I would immediately like to um, go into the um, hot stuff of these talks and um, virtual conference. So I, uh, we can uh, give the presenter rights to uh, Klaus, to Klaus Graman, and um, I'm looking forward to his talk. a few moments to give him the presenter rights okay and then stage is Klaus okay can you all see me and see the presentation yes okay we can so oh, thank you very much PLG, for this um, nice introduction um, as you already said like one week ago we would have met in San Diego for the mobile brain body imaging conference the fourth actually um, if it wasn't for the pandemic, which um, shocked all of us, the world, with uh, hundreds of thousands of deaths, um, loss of life, um, implosion of globalized economics, and other really, really bad things coming along with that, but also um, a lot of very good things, I think. Um, um, civilized societies standing together, helping each other out. Um, and I think from a scientific perspective, it is important to say that we clearly see how important science and the communication of our results is for societies, for a democratic discourse. And I'm very happy that we have this opportunity as part of this scientific exchange and communication today um, for the Brain Products Mobile Brain Body Imaging Award. So I'm happy to be here. And I'm, I'm very happy to state also that um, we have postponed um, our conference to next year, same place, same same date basically um so it's going to be uh, june 6th to june 9th next year in san diego at the Schwartz center for computational neuroscience where mobile brain body imaging basically started where it all began um and i hope this will be possible um, um as a personal meeting so that we can be there and have a personal exchange but there might be also opportunities and we'll see how things develop um with COVID 19 um whether we might also um have um, uh, digital version of the conference. Nonetheless, basically, I'm, I'm happy to, to be here. And I would, first of all, um, um, thank Brain Products for providing this opportunity for young researchers um, and for the field of mobile brain body imaging um, to have this platform to share and communicate our scientific results. And I think we have like three excellent papers and three um, winners that really provided new insights um, using mobile brain body imaging technology, looking into um, the neural foundation um, associated with active behaving participants in the lab or um, using new methods and developing new analytical approaches to analyze these kind of really difficult to record signals in more complex and dynamic environments with actively behaving participants. So I'm very much looking forward and would like to congratulate again Zakaria Jabara and Andrew Norden for um, two first places and um, James Dowsett for the third place, I'm sorry. And I would like to thank um, the jury um, for their thorough reviews and the time and effort put into this review process. Again, we had like a, a really high number of high quality papers. So I was impressed. I didn't um, um, get to read all of them, but I um, um, had like eight or nine papers that I reviewed. And I was really impressed with the quality of the submissions. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to the three winners presenting their work. Besides that, and I don't know how many of you um, are already um, or do have insights into this field of mobile brain body imaging, mobile EEG, and I would like to give a short introduction um, to why I think mobile brain body imaging is important and might give us new insights into um, human brain dynamics and how behavior um, changes human brain dynamics basically. So the question is, why would we want to image the mobile brain? And I think there are several reasons. One of them is that behavioral dynamics will significantly change brain dynamics. And this example here, I hope you can hear it. It's a single cell recording of a heading sensitive cell in the red. So it sounds like a little bit high frequency. And this cell is firing whenever the red is headed into this northeastern direction. And this is um, a really important 
structure or function basically for spatial orientation because it allows to translate egocentrically perceived um, information from the visual system, vestibular system, proprioceptive system into an allocentric reference frame because this kind of egocentric sensory information can be now aligned with allocentric information um, from the outside world like landmarks, visual landmarks like you can see here in this white paper in the surrounding. So um, I'm coming back to this structure later uh, with respect to our research um, in heading um, computation. But this example also clearly shows that cognitive processes are deeply rooted in the body's interactions with the world, as Margaret Wilson nicely stated in her six views on embodied cognition. And I would argue that this is also the case for human brain dynamics. The moment that we start moving, like in this example, Anna Wunderlich, a PhD, here at the Berlin Mobile Brain Body Imaging Labs, um, we look around, we move, we actively behave, and this kind of behavior will definitely change, first of all, the sensory information that we receive. If I start moving, I get vestibular input, I get proprioceptive input, I have afferences that are the very basis for my, my motor um, execution, basically. Um, I have changing visual input, tactile information, and, and so on. Basically, this sensory information that depends on the movement itself will be fed back to the brain and will be processed and by definition this will change human brain dynamics the moment that our behavioral state changes we will see a change in brain dynamic status as in the case for this experiment um, with um, navigation system systems here in the real world in berlin um, there is like the additional impact of less controllable environment high ecological validity, I mean, we can't be more ecologically valid than doing experiments in the real world, but that obviously comes with the cost of not having experimental control over our events. There will be input from unplanned um, events from the outside world, dynamic changes, and all that will be processed by the brain, again, leading to changes in human brain dynamics. So I, I think it is pretty valid to assume that brain dynamic changes um, will be accompanying um, behavioral changes, then the question is why didn't we record or why didn't we image the human brain in active behavior during active behavior yet? And this is mainly because um, the sensors of traditional imaging modalities are too heavy to follow participants' movements. And even in the case of EEG, where we do have lightweight sensors, mobile sensors that are portable to follow participants' movements, we are afraid of movement-related artifacts of distorting the signal of interest. Um, and as a consequence of that, we force participants to sit or lie um, supine in a scanner or in a dog experimental room, not moving at all, um, fixating on, um, on screens and receiving auditory or visual input. And then we reduce this high dimensionality in, in our brain recordings to um, compare that to approximately one bit of behavior, and that is a button press at the end of the trial. And this dimensional mismatch of millions of bits per second from brain imaging modalities and one bit of um, behavior basically is a dimensional mismatch that does not reflect what the brain arguably has evolved for, and I think that is to optimize the outcome of our behavior, to improve our responses, dynamic responses in complex and changing environments. So this would be the reason why we would want to look into mobile brain imaging and use mobile brain imaging to get a better understanding of human brain dynamics in more natural environments. And then how do we do that? And this is um, pretty straightforward. I'm, you need a mobile brain imaging device that can be EEG, that can be functional near infrared spectroscopy. Um, there is MEG on the rise. There might be in a few years mobile MEG um, um, methods available. Uh, the point is that if we have this kind of portable lightweight brain imaging um, modality, we have to synchronize that with our behavior, with movement basically. So we do that by synchronizing the EEG data streams with motion capture. Um, and in our lab, this is the Berlin Mobile Brain Body Imaging Lab that you can see here in the background. That's one of the lab spaces that we have. Um, we use head-mounted virtual reality so that we can control the experimental protocol, that we basically control when 
what kind of events happen, but still have a higher ecological validity and allow full freedom of movement. And if you allow this kind of freedom of movement, then obviously you have to use data-driven analysis approaches to dissociate brain from non-brain activity. And this is um, just one example of two brain sources being active here. This is a simulation by um, um, Zineb Alkalinacha, um, together with Scott from the SCCN, where she shows a um, left motor cortex um, source and the right parietal source being active in parallel. Both are oscillating around 11 and 9 hertz, respectively, and it's slowed down so that we can see what's happening here. So the left hand is like the, a realistic individual brain model, and on the right hand side, you can see the back projection of the two sources to the surface of the skull. And this is basically the sensor space where we record our data. And what you can see is that obviously due to volume conduction, we will record a mixture of both sources being active at any time. And we will measure the mixture of these two sources at basically all places across the skull, not only from the electrodes directly located um, 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 over the sources. And if you then look into like mobile brain imaging approaches, like the one, like this is one of the first experiments that we did together with Dan Ferris back then in Michigan, um, then you can imagine that that is not only associated with two brain sources, but there will be several brain sources being active in parallel. And in addition, there will be eye movement activity. There will be dorsal neck muscle, facial neck muscle activity. There will be cable sway, mechanical artifacts in general um, from the movement itself an electronic artifact and so also we have to dissociate and use data-driven analysis approaches to dissociate these non-brain sources from brain sources and i um clearly say that we have to dissociate non-brain from brain because i consider eye movement and neck muscle activity as part of a functional system supporting cognition and we can learn a lot from looking into eye movements using eg and um, dorsal neck muscle activity, again, using EEG. We just have to use the right tools to look into these signals to use them for better understanding cognition. And I would like to show you one example, um, what mobile brain body imaging might provide you regarding new insights into brain function. And this is coming back to the initial um, example of the red and the heading sensitive cells. This is spatial cognition. And I would like to start with a traditional lab setup that I've been using for years to investigate um, um, reference frame proclivities. I hope you can see that all. And I would like you to now in the coming task, keep up your orientation. You will be um, moving through space. It's a star field and you will be moving straight ahead and then to the left or to the right. And at the end of this path, you have to select one out of two homing vectors pointing back to your starting point of this path. Okay, then here we go. So you see these two homing vectors, the left one pointing back and to the left and the right one pointing right into the back. Um, usually I would ask the audience um, who would pick which homing vector and usually it would be something around 50-50 distribution. Um, unfortunately we can't do that right now but both of these um, homing responses are correct dependent on the reference frame that you would use to basically respond and if you use an egocentric reference frame what you do is basically you update your cognitive heading according to the visual heading changes of the visual flow input. And then after a turn to the right, you would point back and to the right. If you respond based on an allocentric reference frame, you use a reference frame that is still aligned with your monitor frame here. And after a turn to the right, you would point back and to the left. And these strategies are remarkably um, 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 consistent within participants. Um, but more importantly, this is a fantastic task to address the retrosplanial complex and look into the activity of this cortical structure because this is the structure that allows translation of egocentric perceived sensory information into an allocentric reference frame. You can see that here on the left-hand side, it's a fairly huge complex um, um, gathering um, Broadman areas 29, 30, 23, and 31. Um, so it's a transition from parietal cortex to the posterior tip of the cingulate cortex. And the retrosplanial complex, as you can see on the right-hand side here, receives information from the parietal and occipital cortices 
thus it receives multimodal and visual information directly but it also receives information from the anterior um, thalamic nuclei and th these are the nuclei that provide heading information and it is assumed um, that there are also heading sensitive cell populations in the retrosplenial cortex and then you see that there's this connection to the hippocampus down here in the right corner and this allows translation of egocentric information into an allocentric reference frame and vice versa. So looking into the RSC during this kind of orienting task that you just saw, um, this is um, a depiction here of an independent component analysis on several subjects doing this task, half of them with a preference for an egocentric reference frame and half with a preference for an allocentric reference frame. If you look at the retrosplanial complex, that's what you see here in the first row with the independent components here marked in red, and you look at the spectral perturbation patterns over the time course, this is a similar task. It's a tunnel instead of a star field, but it's the same idea, the same results. And here you can see over time of a tunnel passage, um, the frequency changes from 1 to 45 hertz. And what you can see here is a strong desynchronization whenever participants see that the turn is coming up and during the turn itself. And these are participants using an allocentric reference frame. If you look at participants using an egocentric reference frame, it's a similar pattern but less pronounced. The difference is highly significant. The question, however, is would that be the case? Would you even observe different strategies and different responses if you actually turned during this kind of stimulus turn? And this is where we now started looking into heading computation using mobile brain body imaging and comparing this directly with established desktop scenarios. And what you see here again is a setup. So this is a 156 channel high density EEG and we use 28 channels here in the neck to record dorsal neck muscle activity. 128 channels actively amplified um, EEG here um, in the cap um, and that is synchronized to the head mounted virtual reality in the face space system. So we used um, both to integrate and get position and orientation. And this is a general setup before the lab was renovated. In the backpack, we do have a gaming computer, the Zotac, to basically render the virtual reality. And that allows us to then stream that through the MOVE system um, to the amplifier system in the control room. So participants are free to move. It's um, a fairly it's still restricted, obviously. You don't feel really naturally moving in space with 156 channels and a headset, but we're getting closer. So the task here now simply is, you look now at a bird's eye view on the same setup and participants basically see an orienting pole. You would orient towards this, align with it, and then um, that would be replaced by a sphere and that would rotate around you, ending unpredictably on a trial between 30 and 150 degrees to the left or to the right. So, and then participants basically um, were instructed to rotate back and indicate their initial heading. So this is a simple heading computation task. Pressing a button, confirming we got over and under estimation, time of outward, backward rotation, and so on. And we clustered all the performance then um, for three different categories, 45, um, 90, and 135 degrees. Importantly, we compared directly the brain dynamics within participants when they actively physically rotated or on the right hand side when they controlled the same visual flow using a joystick. So this is a replication of the standard um, established lab setups basically where you only have visual flow but no vestibular proprioception um, during this task. If you look at the behavior, this is the joystick condition in blue, this is the mobile brain body imaging condition in green, you see there's a significant improved accuracy in heading estimation basically when you actively rotate and this is not surprising because you have all the sensory information that is available to you usually doing these kind of natural tasks. More importantly if you now look again at the retrosplanial complex this is a different means of um, showing that it's just a, a density plot of the ICs of a cluster that was located in or near the RSC. And what you see here now is a time warped event related spectral perturbation pattern. So the X axis basically shows you the outward rotation period. There is no absolute time anymore because the rotation would take different 
um, durations. If you rotate to 30 degrees, that would be faster than rotating to 150 degrees. So the apex are of different lengths. So you take a single trial and you compute the spectrogram, and then you basically time warp these single trial spectrogram power values to the median latencies across all trials of the movement onset and the movement offset. For the joystick, that would be onset of the joystick and offset. For the physical rotation, that would be the onset of the head rotation and the offset. And after you have all these time warped single trial spectrograms, you just average. So you lose all time information. There's no phase information anymore, but you do have valid power information that you can interpret. And what we see is the replication of the 10 hertz desynchronization that we also found in lots of um, previous stationary um, desktop scenarios with this strong theta rebound here um, with onset of the stimulus and at the end of the trial. So, but how would that look like now if you actively, physically rotate? Well, it looks different. <laughs> pretty, pretty different. And we don't have this kind of desynchronization anymore. We have a strong synchronization in the lower frequency ranges. And even up to alpha, there's still synchronization. But it's impressive to see that you have this very strong theta synchronization here all over the outward rotation period. And then we have some higher desynchronization. The differences here are um, highly significant across um, broad frequency bands. So what can we assume this might reflect? Well, first of all, um, this might reflect heading computation itself, um, because we are looking only at rotation phase. And this was basically replicated in a collaborative experiment that we did at the University of Technology in Sydney, together with Chin Tan Ling and Ang Yang. And here you see a more complex path setup of participants really following more complex paths. Again, following this kind of sphere setup, but they had to remember landmarks point back to the starting location. What you see here in the upper row again is the RSC. And the second row gives you a band pass filter theta power over the time course of all these different segments. So each segment here is the onset of the new sphere where you rotate to follow and then translate. And what you can see in the event related spectral perturbation pattern down there for all the six segments that we did here, you see this theta increase again and again for each of the segments, and you see a continuously desynchronization or continuous um, increase desynchronization in the alpha band across all segments. And these patterns are significant. So we think we might be onto something um, that might reflect heading computation directly in the low theta frequency range, why this continuous alpha desynchronization would reflect the translation of egocentric into allocentric reference, uh, reference frames to have information in both reference frames available for the response to landmarks in an allocentric frame or the homing position. So, and this would be something that would be only possible to see if you actually have physical movement. And we didn't see these kind of theta synchronization patterns in our desktop experiments before, even though we have visual information about optic flow. So we might encounter new insights into brain dynamics, functional differences of different frequency bands or cortical regions dependent on the behavioral state. And this is preliminary, of course, and we have to follow up with that, and we have to be careful with these kind of interpretations, but I think this is a promising start to now look deeper into that. So, um, coming to a conclusion, I think I, I seems to be pretty obvious that brain dynamics and actively behaving participants will change and will be significantly different compared to established stationary setups. And this will reflect basically the computation underlying this active behavior, integration of sensory information, um, efference um, computation, complex sensory motor interaction with dynamic environments, all that will change brain dynamics. And these different behavioral states, importantly, might provide new insights into functional states of brain structures as reflected in frequency domain changes, less so time domain. But this is um, something we have to discuss and see in future experiments. So I think, and we just had this discussion online, um, that we need both. We need mobile brain body imaging and we need established um, lab, lab settings to get a better insight into, for example, established physiological parameters that we know from EG how they might change depend on the behavioral state and basically i think this is a huge opportunity for us mobile brain body imaging is 
a significant opportunity for us for a better understanding of embodied, more natural cognition and the underlying neural dynamics. And with that, I, I would thank the team and all the team members that were um, um, involved in the um, um, experiments that I just showed here and um, our collaboration partners and the funding bodies. And if you're interested in that, and I hope I, um, this is just a start because there will be three um, really cool talks following me now um, about mobile brain body imaging. You can follow us. Um, there's um, um, blogs on the B-Mobile um, research gate and Twitter. And I hope that we will have the next Brain Products Mobile Brain Body Imaging Award next year in San Diego. And I'll see you there in person. Okay, thank you.